I just pressed the let's go live button. So let's wait for the stream to fire up all across the fruited plane of the internet before we go ahead and get started. We've got some serious business to attend to today and we cannot jump into it until the tubes are working and the data streams have connected themselves. And it looks like we are live. We are on YouTube, of course. We're also on Rumble. We're on Twitter. We started on Locals about five minutes ago, but now we're alive all across the plane of America and the world, so let's get started, shall we? Hello, my friends, and welcome back to yet another episode of Watching the Watchers Live. My name is Robert Govea. I am a criminal defense attorney broadcasting from the Valley of the Sun, deep in downtown Phoenix, Arizona. And today, my friends, we have some serious questions. We've got two trials that we are checking in on. The Proud Boys trial is still in the middle of deliberation, and we have to get caught up to speed on exactly what is going on here because we have several different jury notes that came in and jury notes are always fun. We always wanna know what is the jury thinking. And so we've got one, two, three that came in and we've got the judges responses that we will go through. And so we'll go into all of that. There were two motions that came from the defense after the government's closing argument. The defense team said, you guys did a bunch of no-nos illegalities that justify either a curative instruction, meaning the judge would tell the jurors, think about this differently, or number two, get, declare a mistrial and do this whole thing over again. So we've got a curative on behalf of Dominic Pozzola, hat tip over there to Julie Kelly. We also have a Nordeen mistrial motion that we will get into both of those to get us cut up on the Proud Boys case because man, we are waiting for a verdict on this and we gotta discuss it. Now, we also are gonna get into Trump trial day three. And if you wanna join and follow along at home, you can actually access the mind map, the one I'm about to show you at spotlightlawyer.com slash Trump. And if you go there, you're gonna see there's all the different Trump prosecutions. There's a lot of them going on. But the one that we're focused on here today is the one taking place out of the Southern District of New York. We have the various different trial days listed here. We've already talked about day one, where we got the jury selected. Day two yesterday was the direct examination from E. Jean Carroll. And we also had another woman who was a department store clerk who also testified. And today we're gonna be into cross-examination, which is day three, which will be the final version of the, the completion of the direct exam and the cross-examination by Trump's lawyer, Joe Tacopina. And we've got some other things that we have to familiarize ourselves with, some other characters who enter into this trial before we jump into the trial thread as usual. Brought to us courtesy of our friend at Inner City Press, Matthew Russell Lee, over there on Twitter. An excellent follow. If you're interested in the Trump trial, you got to go follow him because he's there. He's on scene and he posts great videos. He's, I'm out here right here this morning. This is my take. So give him a follow. We're going to jump into his trial thread in a short minute. But as you can see, my friends, whew, we've got a lot to get to today. And if you wanna be a part of the program, the best place to do that, the best way to join is to become a member at our amazing community, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. You can also join on YouTube. We have an amazing community on YouTube and we, we do member only streams in the mornings where we talk about some other things that we can't get to here some of the other topical things and we make other videos about those and so come and join us watching the watchers.locals.com or join us on youtube if you become a member either way grab access to our private telegram group so you can join us where the chat never ends on our private telegram group now it is about time to do some heavy legal analysis and before we do that we got to make sure we're properly fortified and neutrified courtesy of our friends over at fieldofgreens.com because we all would like to lose some of those leftover pandemic pounds believe me and how sick are you of all those ads for weight loss pills and fad diets we've all been there we've all done that they just don't work but you know what does eating five healthy servings of fruits and vegetables every day you do that and the weight would probably just fall off but vegetables, not a fan, and who's got time to prepare that every day? Instead, let's talk about Field of Greens. Now, Field of Greens is a science-backed formula, specific fruits and vegetables that you won't find in any other product. Proper nutrition reboots your metabolism so you burn calories faster and lose weight a healthier way. And Field of Greens is the only brand backed by a better health promise. Yes, you're gonna look and feel healthier fast, but the greater proof is gonna come at your next checkup when your doctor says, wow, you've lost weight. Whatever you're doing, 
keep it up. And so let's get you started. 15%, 15 off your first order. Go on over to fieldofgreens.com. Enter in code Robert when you check out. It's not just greens. They've got other things for joints, for sleep, for energy. It's an amazing place. Fieldofgreens.com. The vegetables want to be eaten. Do your part. Mother's Day's coming up. Get your mom some vegetables. Fieldofgreens.com. Code Robert when you check out. All right. And so now, my friends, let's get right into it because we do have some serious business to attend to. And it starts with... Proud Boys trial, it continues with the jury deliberating, and we have some activity today. Several different jury notes came in, three of them in fact, and we want to go through each one and see if we can tease out what the jury is thinking and extrapolate what might be going on in their minds as they consider whether the Proud Boys are innocent or guilty of a whole slew of crimes, the most serious of which is seditionist conspiracy. And so we're going to go through all of it all the different jury notes, as well as two different filings that came out on behalf of the defense team. One on behalf of Dominic Pozzola, who we heard from on trial, actually got up there and testified. And another one from Ethan Nordine asking the court to declare a mistrial. Now, as you can imagine, these motions aren't really likely going to be fruitful, but they're still declaring and showing us, revealing for us, a whole bunch of additional information that will be useful. So let's see what the jury is talking about today. The first jury note came in, and I pulled all of these up so we can get a nice good look at them. This is in the case, all of them, of course, United States of America versus Ethan Nordeen. And this one came in April 27th at 11.45. A oh, no, that's the de declaration. Let me uh, resituate these. This is the first one that came in, yes. The very first note came in, it looked like this one. A note from the jury. And you see the handwriting of this person and you see the punctuation of this person. We see exclamation points, big fan. Says, hi, could the government please remind us of the two exhibit numbers that we're looking for here? One, the video from Reel's phone crossing the barricade at the breach. What exhibit was that? You got like a million of them for us. Which one was that? And number two, the video where Biggs suggests they pull up their masks. Huh? Thank you! Exclamation point. Four persons signed off on it, but the name's been redacted. That came in on April 26 at 4.35 in the evening. So that got filed, but that actually came in yesterday, the day before. So here, two different questions. The video from Reel's phone crossing the barricade at the breach. So they're saying, okay, we want to recreate that scene and see who was where and who did what and how did it all go down. What exhibit was that? They want to go look at it again. It came up in their discussions. Similarly, the video where Biggs suggests they pull their masks up. Uh-oh. Why? To hide your identity as you're committing an insurrection? Uh-oh. So are they doubting that? The video suggests that they pull their masks up, sort of can imply that maybe they're thinking that Biggs is trying to conceal something. So that's the question that came in. What two exhibits do you have for us? And the judge responded, here are the two exhibits. One, the exhibits that are responsive to your two questions are indicated on the attached copy of your note. So the judge just took their note and listed them, said here, Government Exhibit 400D and Government Exhibit 1001 at time 950. And to your second question, you're going to see you can find that in two different exhibits, 404K and 404KX. And so both those notes went back to the jury and they're going to pull those up and they're going to run through them and see what the heck is going on. So that will be in, that's the first set of notes that came in. Then a second set of notes came in from the jury. And they said the following, but this handwriting is a little bit different. This is a different person. They're requesting the following. One, evidence exhibits. They want a copy of the police shield. The U.S. Capitol Police riot shield. They actually want to see the thing. Bring it in here. They want the Proud Boy megaphone. And they want the MOSD, which is the Ministry of Self-Defense leader and the membership chart. And that chart was something that we think we saw 
in court, but I don't know that that was ever admitted as evidence. But they do want to see the shield and they do want the megaphone, which is interesting. Why do they want to see the shield? Do they want to validate Dominic Pozzola's claim that he was using it to guard himself from the police projectiles that were being shot at people's faces and, and verify whether that's true or not? They want to see, it's, is it flimsy? What's the deal? You know, they want to inspect it, but it's the actual shield. So the judge responds and says the following. All right, sure, no problem. You will be provided the riot shield and the megaphone, but the chart you reference was not an exhibit admitted into evidence. So they wanted some of the things that they were just putting up on the screens, but that was just to demonstrate what was going on. It's not actually evidence. So they do get the riot shield. That is evidence. That's going to be coming in. And the megaphone will be coming in so they can test it out. Whose house? Our house. Whose house? Our house. You know, in the jury panel. They're like, wow, that this is this is very insurrectionary. <laughs> do you feel insurrected? Oh, I feel insurrected over here. Put that down. Somebody might take over the jury panel, actually, now that I think about it. Whoever requested these items is probably, the, the judge better be careful. This person better, might take over control of the whole courtroom, now that I think about it. If he gets his hands on the riot shield and the megaphone, Lord help us if he gets control of the podium. We're all doomed. The whole building is going to be taken over. SDNY will be in the hands of this juror. So, all right, well, the judge is playing with fire on that one. We also have another question that came in from the jury, says, our drive is missing an exhibit, 490A, big file, what is that? Says, can we please get someone to check our drive or add this to our drive? It's a big file, we can't see it. And they say, oh, and can we also get a stapler too? Because we got some stapling to do, baby. Signed off uh, by the four person again. <clears throat> and is this the same handwriting as note one? Because if it is, we lost some exclamation points. I can't tell on that one. Yeah, it looks kind of like the same, huh? Maybe she's no more, no more exclamation points. Maybe it's a little different. I think it's a little different, actually. So we have three different handwriting sets, huh? All right, so the point is, we've got another note that came in, and the judge responded, you will get the exhibit back. It's exhibit 490A. And you're also going to get a stapler. And we'll give you extra staples, too. We know how finicky those things can be. So all of that went over. The jury is no longer in session. So they ask questions. Roger Parloff, who has been covering this trial, doing an excellent job, tells us the Proud Boys jury has been excused for the day. They come back tomorrow at 1.30 p.m. because of a juror's appointment. They've got something to do in the morning. Beginning to sound doubtful that we'll get a verdict this week, he says. Very curious from inside the arena from Roger Parloff. Now, there was another exhibit explanation from Roger. He tells us that exhibit 490A, the one that the jury referenced, is a huge video file, 26 gigabytes. I didn't download it because it would take too long, but it shows Enrique Tario coming out of a DC jail on January 5th and being greeted by various women, and guess who? Dum, da, dum, dum, Kenny Lazardo. So the jury wants to see that video. That's great news, that they want to see who that dude is. Kenny Lazardo, who is that guy? They're thinking this through, they're looking at the evidence, they want to inspect the shield, and they're walking through the evidence, which is just great news. And I don't want to, you know, get anybody's hopes up or anything, it's way too premature for that, but they're looking at a video that had nothing to do with January 6th, really. This one was on January 5th, and it's Enrique Tario leaving the jail, being picked up by a confidential human informant source for the FBI called Kenny Lazardo. So they're looking at it again. All very good stuff. So that is the update on the jury notes. Now, there were a couple very interesting filings that came in, and these were the motions for... Uh, mistrials and motions for curative instructions. And I want to give a hat tip over to Julie Kelly on this one. She had a great tweet about it. She says, very interesting motion came in, was denied, of course, by Judge Kelly in the Proud Boys case. That's now with the jury. Pozzola snarked about Ray Epps when he testified, 
But a prosecutor during closing arguments told jury that accusations that Epps was a Fed was a fantasy, right? A fantasy. Like there's no evidence about this at all. And that's, that's a very dishonest thing. There's plenty of evidence. We've talked about it here. There's a whole litany of reasons why Ray Epps is a questionable figure in this whole ordeal. And to, to be so dismissive of it is nonsense. You can say, well, he's a former member of the Oath Keepers. They got prosecuted. He is somebody who was there the night before screaming, going into the Capitol. Many others are being charged with conspiracy for doing a lot less than that. We had a situation where he actually went into the Capitol building and told that to the January 6th select so-called committee. And the FBI had him on their most wanted list of violent people after the insurrection. The tweet is still posted up on their field office. So with all of these different things, it's not a fantasy at all. That's a mischaracterization of this. One of Pozzola's attorneys disagreed with this and submitted a motion. Let's take a look at it. This came on behalf of Dominic Pozzola. They say, comes now, Dominic Pozzola asking for a curative instruction to fix something that happened. This is regarding the role of unidentified persons, possible informants, and confidential human sources. The proposed instruction is necessita necessitated by assertions, claims, and arguments made by the government during their closing arguments. He writes, this is Roger Roots for Dominic Pozzola. He says, for example, the prosecutors, the government, stated during their closing arguments a few days ago that Pozzola's testimonial speculation that Ray Epps may have acted on behalf of the government was a fantasy. Pozzola took the stand and he said something about Ray Epps. The government rebutted that in their closing arguments. This is addressing that. Now, such an argument is not based on the evidence in this case. Mr. Epps has dodged a subpoena in this case, says the defense. And we've covered that. The defense asked for a subpoena that could be served by publication, meaning they could post this somewhere. The judge looked at the rules and said, you really can't do that in a criminal case like this. And you know, he's right. But the point is, the rules don't afford it, but doesn't mean Ray Epps was being a cooperative witness in this case. If he was somebody who really wanted to clear his name, as he apparently wants to do because he shows up on 60 Minutes, a good question would be, why doesn't he respond to a lawful subpoena that was signed off on by a judge? They can't serve him. The judge issued a subpoena, but they can't serve him with it because he is some, nowhere to be found. So they wanted to try to serve him by publication. The judge said, no, I don't have the authority to do that. And I think the judge is right on that. But that doesn't exonerate Ray Epps. Moreover, the government has never categorically denied Epps was a source for all agencies. All agencies. Footnote one. Now, he writes, in a recent interview in an episode of 60 Minutes, which was ridiculous, which we never got to dismantle and destroy, which we very likely will soon, how, because of the Tucker situation. But Mr. Epps emerged from hiding for a Puff Peef's softball interview, they say. The 60 Minutes interviewer asked a suspiciously specific question as they do, along the lines of, did anyone in the government tell you to go to the peace monument? Epps said no. Then at the end of the segment, 60 Minutes reported that the FBI stated that Epps was not an employee or a source for that agency. See how careful that language is? Ray Epps is definitely not a source for the FBI. That's ridiculous. He's, he's no, 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 no. He's never been an inf informant for the FBI. Never for the, FBI, for the FBI, though. Okay, but how about the rest of the government? Is he a source for Department of Homeland Security? Well, look, it's, this is a total conspiracy. There is no evidence at all that Ray Epps is, is an informant, and, and nobody's ever confirmed it. And this, I can tell you unequivocally, he is definitely not a for, an informant for the FBI, okay? That's not what we asked you, weirdos. We want to know the whole of government. Does he work for you in any other capacity as a source? They don't want to answer that question. And these people at 60 Minutes, which as we know, the media is basically writing scripted questions and handing them back and forth between this administration now. So the 60 Minutes conversation should have asked another question. Okay, not the FBI. What about DHS? You working for them? You working for any other agency? There's like 34 of them there in D.C. Can you pick one? Can you affirmatively tell me that there is no relationship with any other federal agency whatsoever, period? Unequivocally, everybody. Go, so you can say it at the same time. Ready? Go. No. 
no, they won't do it because they know it's not true. So Mr. Pozzola and his attorney say the government has refused to say whether Epps had a reporting relationship with HSI, which, as we know, which came out in this trial, is known to have handled CHSs on January 6th. And the court has denied efforts by the defense to inquire about these questions. It's not relevant. It's a whole separate agency. What do they have to do with anything here? They say they're not even case agents here. The FBI did the investigation. The FBI is prosecuting this. Confidential human sources are irrelevant. The defense argues that the evidence reveals several other suspicious actors who play destructive or instigator roles, but who are not identified. A significant example is the man in the red who first broke the window, which Dominic Pozzola is accused of breaking. That individual is known to have been present at nearly every breach and was not and was even next to Ashley Babbitt at the time of Babbitt's murder. Yet the government has not identified or charged that person. The man in the red. Who is that person? Footnote 2. The man in the red who first broke the window would likely have been the second person into the house corridor if Ashley Babbitt had breached the corridor. No charges for him. No identifications for him. Curious. Now, the government's closing argument, therefore, misleads the jury, writes the defense. Pozzola asks for a, cur a curative instruction to correct this along the following lines. They want the judge to tell the jury to say, hey, jurors, during the trial, you've been informed that undercover confidential CHSs of the government may have been involved in events. Now, there has been speculation and testimony or evidence that individuals other than the defendants may have played roles other than the defendants may have played roles in the formulation and execution of the crimes in this case. You should disregard any assertions regarding whether a person is or is not a CHS unless those assertions are based on evidence. And you may draw an inference that the identity of unidentified or missing significant participants in criminal events or circumstances where the government likely knows the participants' identities, if you knew them, they would be unfavorable to the government. So saying the government knows who these people are, they're not telling you who they are. They played a significant role, a major part in this crime, and you can hold that against the government. Because as we talk about, think of it like a pie chart. If there's a thousand people who are charged with crimes for an insurrection, who's really responsible for the insurrection? In this case, we want to know who is responsible for the, the, the initial breaches, most of the damage, right? The biggest cause of the interference with our democracy, as they say. We want to know that. Who is it? So if we can apportion liability and say you're 50% responsible and you're 50% responsible, then great, we can charge people with crimes and apportion it appropriately. But when you break it out by a thousand people or when you say the Proud Boys did it, but then we say, what? There's also 50 other CHSs that have been rumored to have been a part of this. And there's also the man in the red who is at every other breach as well. So maybe they should be apportioned some percentage of this blame and not the Proud Boys. And if the government's not going to tell you about these other people, then you can take that sliver of blame and give it to the government. Give it back to them. Don't give it to our clients. Respectfully submitted Roger Root's certificate of service signed April 25th, 2023. Now, as Julie Kelly told us, the judge very likely took a look at this and he said, get out of here. What are you nuts? Pff, denied. Next. And threw it right in the garbage, maybe in the shredder after it got put on the court docket. But the point remains unidentified people, people who were right next to the defendants when they were accused of committing these heinous, seditionist crimes, not charged with anything. We still don't know who the pipe bomber is, right? Where's that guy? All of them are not found. We don't know if they ever will be found, but we do know the government got the people that they wanted and they charged them accordingly. There was another motion for a mistrial. This one came in on behalf of defendant Ethan Nordine. This is six pages long. This is Ethan Nordine's motion for a similar argument for curative instructions or in the alternative for a mistrial. Now he says, your honor, back during closing arguments, the government delivered a rebuttal argument. And he says four subject areas had improper argument. We want curative instructions and a mistrial. First, the government doesn't need to need not prove the defendants agreed to any plan. 
which is a mere detail of a conspiracy. So this is kind of a technical argument. In multiple places, the jury instructions correctly treat the terms appropriately. And he's referencing the jury instructions. But during closing argument, the court suspended Nordine's argument to admonish his lawyer that he couldn't make arguments to the jury based on the D.C. Circuit law. And that's exactly what happened. We were reading through the closing argument and the judge excused the jury and he did admonish him. And he said, how dare you put that slide up here? That's not what the law is. And I get to decide what the law is. The court commented to the effect that, quote, the essential nature of the plan standard was just dicta from that case, which means it's not actually law. Dicta is like, it's just opining. It's in the case, it's in the opinion, but it's, it does, it's not controlling. It's just somebody saying something that's kind of irrelevant. And so if you extract it, you say, okay, that's a nice sentence you took from that opinion. But that sentence had nothing to do with the actual holding in the case. Therefore, it doesn't hold, it doesn't apply. The law is not that. The law is this. Saying it's just dicta. But the defense says, that's not correct, Your Honor. The D.C. Circuit Court has applied the essential nature of the plan standard to conspiracy cases since the 1980s. And the facts in a Hemphill case show that the essential nature of the plan formulation has bite, and it's not superfluous language that the court can just throw away as dicta. It actually means something. Explaining why sufficient evidence established the defendant's guilt on a conspiracy charge, the Court of Appeals cited evidence showing his execution of a plan was sufficient. So the government, when the government made it a central theme of its rebuttal, that it doesn't need to prove that any Proud Boy understood or agreed to any plan, it was misleading the jury as to law. They don't need to have a plan, they said. They don't even need to have a understood a plan. Uh, you know, whatever. It's like close enough. So as the court points out, this is an issue that goes to the heart of the case, directly to the conspiracy charge. And the government's rebuttal used this inaccurate statement of the law to bolster their credibility of Bertino. So this improper argument is not somehow harmless. It injected a semantic distinction between the word plan and agreement. And it goes without saying, this is going to cause confusion for the jury. So the court should read a curative instruction that gives the jury an accurate description of the standard. Says the prosecutors also misled the jury about a sentence being imposed. In the rebuttal close, the government prosecutors suggested that Nordine misled the jury about a potential prison sentence. Nordine argued that Bertino may have pleaded guilty to seditious conspiracy and the government purported to disprove this by saying, no, it's a bigger statutory penalty. Here, the government misstated the law and again misled the jury. And we have finally the fourth rebuttal. This is they're saying that the government in their closing arguments said that the Proud Boys, quote, almost destroyed the Constitution. Wow, did they? Is the U.S. Constitution in there readily available to be destroyed? Did they get their hands on it? Was it next to the podium? Now, the prosecutor said this, and the defense says this remark being delivered near the close was grossly inappropriate. It was prejudicial. In fact, it was prosecutorial misconduct. And a mistrial is warranted, citing a 1984 case. It says a prosecutor may not urge jurors to convict a criminal defendant in order to protect community values, preserve civil order, or deter future lawbreaking. The prosecutor may not make statements, in closing, calculated to arouse passions or prejudices of the jury. Now, in this case, the Court of Appeals has found improper government argument where they said that the defendant's conduct would lead to martial law being imposed. Not appropriate saying that the Proud Boys, quote, almost destroyed the Constitution is plainly inappropriate and highly prejudicial, and it was calculated. The government knows better. It was delivered at the very end of the rebuttal, literally the last words heard by the jury before deliberation. Nordine has been substantially prejudiced, and mistrial should be declared. Signed by defense attorney David Smith for the very inappropriate language being dropped by prosecutors. Destroy the Constitution? Give me a break. 
not true at all. And DC circuit law says that you're not allowed to say those things. We'll see what the judge does with that one. Very likely what he does with all of the other defense motions and just rules against them quickly. Now, that is the latest out of the Proud Boys trial. They have been excused for the day, of course. We will continue to cover this as soon as there is a verdict. We will do our best to go live to cover it and get it live if we can get it live. But we will cover it regardless. We'll see what the notes look like. We'll continue to check in. So thank you for subscribing and following along wherever it is you're watching this. And we'll look forward to seeing you on the next one. All right, my friends. Now, with that trial wrapping up, we are waiting for a verdict. And we have to turn our attention over to the Trump trial. And of course, this is available. This mind map is available at spotlightlawyer.com slash Trump. And you can go take a look at this mind map. And we will get into it right now because we have a whole day three to attend to. So let's do it. Shall we? Trump trial day three continues. We hear from Miss. Carol, on direct examination, wrapping up with her attorney, Roberta Kaplan, who has been on this case for quite some time. Miss Carol is going to also be cross-examined by Joe Tacopina, Donald Trump's lawyer. And this is an interesting situation because Joe Tacopina is also representing Trump on his criminal case out in New York, being brought by Alvin Bragg and Manhattan DA, the Manhattan DA's office. Joe Tacopina is representing Trump in this case, which is a civil case, which is really predicated on an old criminal allegation. And it's almost a preview of what Joe is going to do in the criminal trial in New York. So this is a civil case, but it's very much like a criminal case because of the conduct that is being alleged. So we'll see how Joe does here during his cross-examination and see if any of that will translate over to the Manhattan case. So we've got our trial thread, as usual, courtesy of our friend at Inner City Press, which I really encourage you to follow. He's doing excellent work and making separate videos from outside the courtroom, which is well worth your time. But before we check in with the thread, let's take a look at what we need to understand in order to make this tread move along, thread move along smoothly. Got to get familiar with a couple people who are going to pop up. One person is named Molly Jongfest. She is a podcaster and an editor with the Daily Beast, apparently there was a party at which George Conway attended, and that sparked some of the initial conversation around the litigation. George Conway, you're familiar with as the ex-husband to Kellyanne Conway, who is now free. Now, that those are the two people who came up in the trial, as well as these individuals, and we heard about these people yesterday on day two, but Les Moonves came in as the former CEO of CBS, he also got allegations brought against him by Miss Carroll. She said that he assaulted her, and she's also been assaulted by other people, like camp counselors and other individuals. She also brought up this guy, John Johnson, and there was a racist comment about him. He was her ex-husband. She called him a racist name, and there was a debate about whether that comment could come into trial because John Johnson, according to Miss Carroll, also got violent with her after a comment was made his direction. And so we are seeing this pattern where there's a history of allegations against other men by E. Jean Carroll. And Trump's defense team wanted to talk about this. They wanted to bring in this fact that E. Jean Carroll had said a racial epithet against John Johnson. And the judge said, no, you can't bring that in, which is why we have this marked out in red. That little bit of evidence is not going to come into court today. And it was a very interesting thing that popped up because as we've seen, we know that many courts are perfectly okay allowing racist things to come into court, racist comments, racist videos, racist behavior, racist language and text messages. It just depends on the courtroom and really the defendant. If you're a J6 defendant, your racist comments can come in against you. If you're a Donald Trump plaintiff and Donald Trump is the plaintiff, is the defendant and the plaintiff said something bad and racist, they keep that out of court to protect the plaintiff in order to make their case against Donald Trump persevere. In this case, the judge made the comment, no, it's a, it's a mixed race jury. Are you nuts? I'm not going to put that in here. They'll be outraged about that. It would make E. Jean Carroll's case lose or be harmed. And the judge can't see any benefit 
of allowing that in, so they keep it out. So that also was one thing that was kept out. The other thing that we learned about was the founder of this lawsuit. They don't want to talk about it, but it's true. Reed Hoffman, the founder of LinkedIn, a billionaire, was disclosed to have been funding this lawsuit by Roberta Kaplan to Alina Abba, Donald Trump's lawyer. That was kept out yesterday. And there were some interesting tweets that we heard about yesterday, but those didn't get brought back up. We are going to go back to Lisa Birnbach. She was a best-selling author. She was one of the two women that allegedly Miss Carroll sent a copy of her book to when the book about Trump was being published and some of the people that she talked to right after the ordeal happened. Carol Martin is the other person that she talked to. She was a former CBS TV anchor and Lisa was a best-selling author. So we've got a lot of people. We'll try to flip back and see who is who as we go through the testimony. We're going to jump around a bit, but there is another conversation about this video that came up today. The question about this ordeal involves an assault by Donald Trump in a dressing room. And it involves the R word, which he's going to drop right here. But we are asking questions about her understanding of what that word means. Here's what she said on CNN. You don't feel like a victim. I was not thrown on the ground and ravished which the word rape carries so many sexual connotations. This was not, this was not sexual. For, it just, it, it hurt. It just, what, it just, you know. Well, I think most people think of rape as a, I mean, it is a violent assault. It is not I a think sexual. most people think of rape as being sexy. Mm. What? Let's take a short break. Think of the fantasies. Mm. Let's take a break. We're going to take a quick break. We're yeah, cut it. If you can stick around, we'll talk more on the cut other it. side. You're fascinating to talk to. Cut it. Cut it, cut it, cut it. Tucker's like, cut it. The producer's like, cut it. Get, get to break right now. This lady's nuts. You don't feel like a victim. I was not thrown on the ground and ravished. Which, the word rape carries so many sexual connotations. This was not, this was not sexual. For, it just, it, it hurt. It just, what, it just, you know. Well, I think most people think of rape as a, I mean, it is a violent assault. It is not I think sexual. most people think of rape as being sexy. Mm. Let's take a short break. Cut it. The commercial, commercial, commercial. We're going to take a quick break. Commercial. If you can stick around, we'll talk more on the other side. You're fascinating to talk to. <laughs> yeah, yeah. You're fascinating to listen to, lady. All right. So that is going to come back up in trial, right? Because Donald Trump and his defense team, they saw that interview and they're like, wait a minute. Rape is sexy. Most people don't think about it in that way. Okay. What is going on here? So now... We are going to go into the trial thread and the trial thread, as I mentioned, courtesy of our friend over at Inner City Press. Please follow him on Twitter and his Substack and elsewhere. But this is something we're going to hear about the, the plaintiff's team. As we go into the trial thread, they're going to try to do what's called drawing the sting. They know the, that this woman has a ton of bad facts that are floating out there and they want to get it out before Trump's team gets it out. So we're going to go into the direct exam. And her lawyer, which is Miss Roberta Kaplan, is going to be back out doing the direct exam, asking questions, and going to try to talk about all the bad things and try to get it out first. Because if she can talk about it first, that's better than the defense talking about it. And so she's going to try to bring it out kind of with kids gloves before we turn it over to Joe Tacopina for our defense conversation. So let's go back over to our friend at Inner City Press and get right into it. Trump trial day three. E. Jean Carroll is back on the witness stand. Judge is there and we get started right away. Jury's entering, all rise. <clears throat> Please be seated, all right. Judge says, all right, ladies and gentlemen, I'm sorry for the delay. I was working with the lawyers on something that needed to be addressed here. Uh, but Miss Carroll, you're back on the witness stand. Uh, just a reminder, you are still under oath. Counsel? Miss Carroll's lawyer, probably Miss Kaplan, gets up and says, Miss Carroll, were you assaulted by Les Moonves, who is, as we saw, this person right here? Were you assaulted by Les Moonves? She says, Yeah, I was. But he denied it. Well, if he denied it, did you sue him for defamation? No, I didn't. Well, why didn't you sue him? You're suing Trump. Why didn't you sue him? 
Oh, well, Les didn't defame me. Unlike Trump, who called me a scam and a Democratic operative, Moonves stayed quiet. So now we're trying to draw distinctions, right? Because she's been assaulted by another person, didn't sue him. And we know she's got a lot of biases against Donald Trump and she's a big Democrat and Donald Trump's a Republican. So maybe this lawsuit is about something else. Maybe it's not about the assault. Maybe it's about the name calling. So the, the, the plaintiff's team, Carol's lawyer, has to get this out now. Counsel says, oh, Ms. Carol, who is Natasha Stoinoff? She's a People Magazine reporter and she had Trump. Trump was her beat, so she followed Trump around. Have you ever given any interviews? And Carol says, yeah. Been on CNN? Been on Lawrence O'Donnell? I've been on the Washington Post? Been all over the place. I talked to everybody about this. And counsel says, Carol, I noticed that you're coughing here. Now, I know you've got the water to your left there is fresh. The right, I'm not so sure of that one. So why don't you just stick with the left? Don't drink that water over there. She says, okay. I want to go back to your an interview with Anderson Cooper. We have this as a plaintiff exhibit. So the, her lawyer is bringing this in to draw the sting, right? To get it out there because the defense is going to do it if they don't. Plaintiff offers 108. Mr. Takapina, any objection, defense? No objection. They play the video, the one that we just played. And they say, wow, Miss Carol, did you just describe rape as sexy? She says, no. They play the video again. Most people think of rape as being sexy. She says, well, what do you mean by that? Oh, she says, oh, well, that I, that, I said that rape is used in our culture, like in entertainment, you know, like in Game of Thrones and that type of stuff. You know, there are nine violent rapes as plot development to bring in a bigger audience. Even old movies like The Fountainhead portrayed rape on the screen. Ms. Carol, but do you believe rape is sexy, like you said on the thing? No, no, I don't. No, it's one of the most violent things that can happen to a woman or a man. Do you believe that what Donald Trump did to you was sexy? No. And so what did you sue Donald Trump for? She says defamation. Why'd you sue him for that? Well, he said I was in a conspiracy with the Democratic Party. He said I was trying to sell a book. He said that I was too ugly to attack. When did you think about suing him, Carol? Well, when journalists would ask me about it, sometimes I'd give it some thought. Was there any conversation in your mind that actually crystallized this for you? She said, yeah, I had a conversation with George Conway. George Conway is this guy. George Conway, former husband of Kellyanne Conway, who is much better off now, and is Conway, as we know, made a recommendation over to Roberta Kaplan from prior conversations. So let's see where this goes. Says, who is George Conway? Oh, he's a Republican lawyer. Do you know his views of Donald Trump? She says, yeah, he does not like Donald Trump. Where'd you meet him? I was at a party with Erica Jong's daughter. Her name is Molly Jongfest. She's a respected podcaster. That's these two here. They're throwing a Trump-hating party. Conway shows up along with Molly Jong. They're hanging out discussing whatever TDSers discuss. It says, did you file this lawsuit to make money? She said, no, definitely not. I don't care about the money. This is about getting my name back. You write for Substack, don't you? You make some money from there? Yeah, I do. And I actually provide updates on my case there. Who came to your parties? Well, she's, you know, everybody would come in, uh, journalists, podcasters. Would celebrities come? Oh, yes, yes. I like attention. There's no question about that. I definitely do like attention. But not necessarily for suing Donald Trump or for being attacked. Said I'd prefer to get attention for making, you know, a green three bean salad or something. 
Ms. Carroll, do you regret bringing this lawsuit? Five times a day, she says. It's like I look at social media and I see the onslaught against me from YouTubers. Have people asked to make documentaries about you, Carol? Yes. And you started filming one? Yeah. Well, why did you stop filming one? Well, this case became too important to me. Tell me about the most recent thing that you've seen about this case. She said, Donald Trump tweeted that the best example of injustice was my suing him. Where'd you see that? I think I saw it on social media. And what's this? She put something up on the screen. This is his true social piece. He posted it on the social media site. Is this the one where he called your case a con job, E. Jean? Yes. Is this the one where he called the justice system a disgrace? Yes. Is this the one where he said, and this woman is not my type? Yes. And she's looking at the judges and she's looking at the jurors as she's saying this. Roberta Kaplan is saying, he called the justice system a disgrace. Looking at you, your honor, looking at you. Wow. And then he, and then she looks at the women on the jury. Is this the tweet where he said that you're not his type? Wow. How did that impact your reputation, Carol? I thought I was back on my feet and I thought I had garnered some readers and then boom, he knocks me back down again. Again, I don't think she got knocked down in the first place, right? Were you surprised? I was stunned. Why? Because I'm suing him for this. Like I'm suing him for defamation and he keeps saying it. I'm also suing him for assault under the Adult Survivors Act passed by the New York State Legislature and I had one year to sue. So you're suing him under a law that just got passed for adult survivors. Counsel says, did you advocate for that law? Like, did you want this law to be passed? She says, yeah. How come? Because I understand why women and some men do not come forward for years. Miss Carroll, I want to ask you about this post. After his October 12th posting, what did you experience? A wave of slime. People repeating what Donald Trump said, working for the Democrats and things like that. It's way too ugly. It's hard to wake up to that. People telling you you're too ugly to go on living practically. Miss Carroll, what's this? And it's very somber in this courtroom, all right? It's very dramatic. A lot of, lot of dramatics, theatrics. Oh, okay. Put something else up on the screen. Miss Carroll, what's this? That's a tweet from October 12, 2022. Your Honor, the plaintiff offers 45 exhibit, which is, it's exhibit 45, <laughs> which is fun. Judge says, proceed. Now this is apparently a nasty reply. There's a D word and there's a B word in there. And it's an RSBN posting. Shout out to the Right Side Broadcasting Network. Love you guys. Shout out. Keep up the great work. Apparently from a Max account. So somebody posted a reply to their work. And it has a D word and a B word. So apparently it's not even Donald Trump's tweet, right? It's just a reply. What's this one? That's another tweet. Your Honor, plaintiff offers 48. So they're getting tweets now and, and offering these as evidence. What's this one? Oh, this is a reply by somebody called Ezekiel. I don't know who the hell that is. Calling Carol a BSer in reply to a New York Daily News article. Wow, so, so they just surfed the internet and got some bad comments. Great. Yeah, she should you know, start a podcast, start a YouTube channel. A lot of fun comments. That's part of the, part of the deal. Okay, when you become a public person, 
and you make accusations like this, people are going to say things about it, especially if it happened 28 years ago. What's this? Oh, it's another tweet from January 15th. It's another one. This one is from the TRPS, from an account, TRPS. Now, counsel says nothing further, Your Honor. So they are bringing in tweets now. I guess these are illegal. Did Trump uh, tweet this? No. Did anybody near Trump tweet it? No. Trump had an opinion. Other people responded to the opinion. Trump should be punished for other people's responses to his statements. As evidence into the jury, they exhibit, uh, introduce exhibits. What, What a joke. All right. So they end their testimony on that. That is our direct examination from this woman. Just amazing. So it goes on. Counsel says, nothing further, Your Honor. Look at this horrendous tweets. So judge says, all right. Well, is this the point you and Mr. Takapina need some time? So it's going to go over to cross-examination now. And Kaplan says, you need a minute? Takapina says, yeah, Your Honor, we'll take a bit of time now to save a bit more in the future. 15 minutes. I'll give you 15 minutes. Go prepare your cross-examination. All rise. All right, please be seated. Jury comes back in. We fast forward. Parties ready? Cross-examination, Mr. Takapina. So now we have the defense. Trump's lawyer called Mr. Takapina, this individual right here, leading the cross-examination against E. Jean Carroll seen here. This is the main witness of this case. This is the victim, allegedly. And Tacopina is also going to be representing, as far as we know currently, Donald Trump and his Manhattan case. So we want to see what this looks like. It's kind of a preview before the big game, like exhibition in a civil case to see how the player plays in a criminal case. Now, obviously, the Manhattan case is a very different type of criminal trial. It's a stupid business records account. This is a physical assault account, but it's a civil trial, so it's much different standards. It's not the same thing, but it's a bit of a preview. Let's see how this goes. Inner City Press reporting. Mr. Takapina, floor is yours. He says, Miss Carroll, I'm going to offer into evidence, Miss Carroll's, uh, he says to the judge, I'm going to offer into evidence Ms. Carroll's book, Subject to Redactions. He says, okay, it's admitted on that basis. He holds it up. It's going in. Your book's going in. Redactions going in. Any objections, prosecution, or uh, plaintiff? Nope. Judge says, okay, admitted. He holds it up. He says, Ms. Carroll, yeah, this story's a bit odd, right? Some parts, yeah. Your Ask E. Jean column when you were writing back in New York, That gave you some status, didn't it? She pauses, thinks. Yes, it did. And in 2019, Elle magazine, they fired you, correct? Yes. And you experienced a different life then, right? That you were just another person after that, weren't you? Well, I never felt like another person. But you told your expert witness that after you lost your job, you felt just like another person, didn't you? Yeah, you're right. Yes, I did say that. That's because status is important to you, isn't it, Miss Carroll? Status is important, yeah. And you're a Democrat. And you were in disbelief about Donald Trump, weren't you? Yeah, I felt really bad, yes. Probably talking about when he won. And you wrote a book at some point saying, what do we need men for, right? And he's looking at the jury now. And it's more men on the jury than women. Six to three by our count. And he looks at every one of them, just like Miss Kaplan did. What do we need men for? You wrote this? Looking each one of them in the eye. What do we need men for? Interesting. Yeah, I wrote it. 
Now, you wrote in this book, supposedly, about being attacked. Not supposedly. Yeah, but you said you didn't speak up in 2016 when Trump was running because your mom was dying. Is that true? Well, that was one of the reasons. Back then, I was never going to talk. But your mother was dying, wasn't she? She was on her deathbed. She passed away in October of 2016. And so why didn't you come out before the election? I was in mourning. Her voice is breaking. Shout out to her mom. May her mom rest in peace. I was in mourning. It was not that book. Tacopina says, it was not that the book wasn't ready. You emailed an excerpt to Lori Abram, right? She says, I did. Can you show me the email? He says, sure. Yeah, it's Defense Exhibit AB. It was on June 13th, 2019. It's right here. Grab it. Recognize it? So you wrote that you thought Donald Trump in this book was trying to kill you? Is that what you said? You emailed an excerpt to Lori Abraham, and in it, you said that Trump was trying to kill you. To to poison your water? Is that what you're saying? She said, uh, that was a draft. That wasn't published. Well, I'm asking you about it right now, Miss Carroll. You wrote it, right? Yeah, I wrote it. Is that true? I hope he asked those questions. Let's see. Maybe he did and we don't have it in the transcript. But I'm asking you about it now. Now, Carol Martin, she also has strong feelings about Donald Trump. Is that true? Carol Martin is this woman here, former or maybe current, I'm not sure, CBS TV anchor down here, saying that she also had strong feelings about Trump, didn't she? Yeah. And she wrote to you, she she sent Orange Crush called Namibia, Namibia, Nambia at the UN, right? Yes, she wrote me. And she wrote to you, this has to stop, right? Yeah, she did. And you indicated back to her that you do anything to take down Donald Trump, didn't you? Those aren't my words. But you told Carol Martin that you had something for her, right? What was that? Oh, I don't remember. I have no idea. Something about Andy Borowitz or something like that. She said, this email is from less than five years ago. You don't remember what you wrote in this email? No, I can't remember it. But you remember what happened 30 years ago, 28 years ago? She says, well, I remember the attack, but this email... Gosh, I send and receive so many emails. Does the word scheme mean, what does it mean to you, the word scheme? She says, uh, well, it carries no connotation of evil. It's just a word we use. She has colorful language and so do I. So something in the, something in the emails from Carol Martin, they're sending messages back and forth. What does the word scheme mean? Are you guys going to enter a scheme? She says, no, nothing evil. It's just a word we use, you know. She has colorful language, and so do I. It's not a, it's not a scheme to do anything. But you produced this email, right? You, you created this? Was there any other one? Did any other person mention scheme? So I don't know. I didn't review them. So you say you have no idea what this quote, something special that you had for Carol Martin was. You don't have any idea what that was when you sent it to her? No, we exchanged a gift. That's all I know. And she and Miss Bernbach are your two witnesses, right? Yes. Counsel, objection. Objection sustained. We don't know if they're going to be the two witnesses, I guess. And so these are the two people they're talking about. Lisa Bernbach and Carol Martin, CBS TV anchor going to be the two witnesses, presumably for the plaintiff, Miss Carroll. So Takapina's back up for cross-examination. Says, okay, Miss Carroll, you set out on a road trip to gather information for your book to go do some research? Yeah. And you discussed it with Carol and you discussed it with Lisa back in June. In fact, June 23rd, 2019, before Trump's running again. And you texted Miss Birnbaum 
that you told Megan from the New York Times about this, right? Yeah. And so you told Megan a lie, didn't you? No, I told her the truth. I hadn't heard back from Lisa and Carol, and I assumed, and you know, the first three letters of that says to this day, I don't know if Kara, Carol and Lisa even read the chapter, but they're your witnesses. She says, well, you'll have to ask them. So you wrote it. You never read it. She says, gosh, I was very ill. I made out a will. I made Lisa Bernbach my executor and I didn't, and Lisa didn't read it because she didn't remember my password to get in to read the draft. When you said you assumed she'd read it, she says, I ask her. If she read the chapter I gave her at Carmine's, I don't know if she read the chapter where I said Trump was going to poison me or not. But you supposedly spoke to them the day of the alleged attack, but they couldn't give you a specific date, right? You, you don't have a date and they can't give you a date, right? We can't. I wish we could give you a date. You can't even give us the year, right? Lisa believes that since she wrote about Mar-a-Lago in February, she would not have gone if I'd told her, so it must have been in 1996. She swears to that. He says, well, we'll get a chance to talk to Lisa later, I'm sure. Miss Carroll, yesterday you said for the first time that it was a Thursday. You pulled that date out of a hat. Well, it's a Thursday. But you were never sure of the year either before that, right? Yeah. But suddenly you know the day of the week. She says, I, I said it out loud. But you never verbalized it before today, that day in court, right? No. And before publishing your attack story, you never made that date public, right? I was never going to. In your book, you talk about disposing of all men. Is that here? He looks at the men in the jury panel again. Disposing of all men. Hmm. She says it was satire. You understand that, right? He says it comes from Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal. Uh, Jonathan, judge chimes in says it comes from Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal. Which, I don't know what that is. Jonathan Swift's A, a Modest proposal, proposal, does that say eliminate all men from everything? So the judge... Okay, so this is a weird statement. This judge is interjecting strangely. Apparently, from Encyclopedia Britannica, a modest proposal by Jonathan Swift is a full proposal. It's an economic, it's a presented in the guise of an economic treatise. And so it's a, it's a masterpiece of satire, rational deliberation and all these things. Okay, so this, this I don't think is really appropriate. Why is this judge chiming in on this? It comes from Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal. So he's giving validation, in other words, to her testimony. It's satire, you understand? Yeah, idiot, Tacopina, Trump lawyer. It comes from Jonathan Swift's A Modest Proposal, you troglodyte idiot. What's he weighing in there for and supporting her? So Takapina's like, thanks, Judge. What the hell are you talking about? It's my question. Can you let me do my thing? He says, okay, in your road trip, Miss Carol, you kept a list of the most hideous men. Was that satire? She says, no, that was dead serious. But it had a lighter moment. Men who performed something I could not perform. And the mechanic you wrote about who put your wheel on wrong. She said, yeah, that guy cost me $2,000. So this book was a book that you desperately wanted to sell, wasn't it? You were out there on the road and all these things. It says, yeah, I wanted to sell the book I was writing. And naming Donald Trump was a major element to selling your book, wasn't it? Yeah, I thought it would attract people. I was wrong. It was Harvey Weinstein's story that caused you to come forward. Is that right? Yeah, I realized we had a chance to limit the harm that was happening out there. But those women went to the police, didn't they? Um, no, I don't know. I don't know. Is Weinstein in jail? Objection sustained. Trump's lawyer asks, Miss Carroll, you received a signing bonus when you filled this out, didn't you? 
She said, I have no idea what that is. A signing bonus? You don't know what a signing bonus is? He says, well, I've got a part of your deposition here. I'm just going to play a part of it. Let me know when you're ready. Okay, I'm ready. Go ahead and play it. So then they play it, and Carol in the recording says, they may have given me a signing bonus. And he goes back to her, and he goes, hmm? What about that? And she says, oh, like a baseball player. Yeah. So you gave it to the New York mag. You gave your, your piece to the New York mag magazine says, well, I gave him a combination of chapters and the judge says, okay, that's a good time to take a break. So we'll just go ahead and leave it there for a quick minute. Break until 2 PM. And so of course we're sticking with inner city press and we're fast forwarding right through lunch and we come back. It's 2 p.m. We're back. The judge says, ladies and gentlemen, poof, I hope you enjoyed your delicious repast. Miss Carol, you're still under oath. They're all wiping the French fries off their faces back here. Mr. Takapina, you may proceed. He says, Miss Carol, you kept the photo that you took with Donald Trump and Ivana for two decades, didn't you? Yeah. And that's your ex-husband, John Johnson there, who you said strangled you? And she says, yeah. And this photo is everywhere. And let's see. if I can grab it and we can see it, here it is. This is the photo that they are talking about. And you can see this is supposedly E. Jean Carroll, I guess, here. And that's John Johnson, unless that's E. Jean Carroll. I think that's E. Jean Carroll, no? All right, one of them is there. So let's see where this line of questioning goes. And your ex-husband, John Johnson's in that picture, right? Yeah. And you kept the photo with Donald and Ivana for two decades? Yeah. You don't recall where the parties were hosted though, right? No. And you don't recall what you discussed? Well, I think it was juicy, but I don't remember the topic that they were talking about in that picture. Well, when'd you take the picture? I don't know. Sometime between 1987 and 1996. Wow, that's a pretty big window. <laughs> okay. Yeah, like almost a 10-year window there. Could have been any time in there. Just like the rape. I don't know. Sometime, I don't know. 1990s, I don't know when it was. I don't know. Like Nirvana era, something. I don't know. Something happening. But it happened, though. Takapina says, all right, Miss Carol, let's go to the deposition from October. You said he waved to you on the street. You remember that? When? You said he waved to you on the street. Question, Miss Carol, when? Answer, 1994 or 1995. You said he waved to me on the street. You said we were on different sides of the street. You say he greeted you, but hadn't seen you in eight years. And Carol's lawyer jumps in here and starts with objection. We get argumentative here because it's not really a question. Say, you say he greeted you, but he hadn't seen you in eight years. Yeah, how do you really answer that? But you could break that up into questions. So she calls him out, a subje a, a objection sustained. Takapina then goes back and says, okay, so I will break this down into, into questions. And he starts again. Between 1987 and 1995, the judge says, hey, we can all do math here, Tacopina. Move on, which is just insane because the judge is literally cutting him off on, again, he's sort of vouching for the witness. Yeah, no, it's, it's a treatise, obviously. We can do the math, Trump lawyer. Shut up and move on. Gosh, okay, judge. 
Miss Carol, would you agree with me that Bergdorf's Dorf's is a posh facility? She says, yeah. And it's gracious? She says, that's conducive to shopping. You said it, it, it's so upscale that it refers to customers as clients. Did you say that? She says, I'm not so sure I said that. Your book didn't say that if you were at Bergdorf that day, whether it was a revolving door or a hinge door. Did you talk about that? Revolving door or hinge door? So, uh, now I know that it was a revolving door. And you said that Donald Trump was alone, right? I believe so. And you said that nobody witnessed this interaction. And Kaplan, the judge, chimes in again. He says, it's not clear if the witness said yes or no. I would hope, Mr. Takapina, that you phrase your questions better so we don't have to keep doing this. <laughs> okay, now Takapina says, oh gosh, geez, Louise judge, says, okay, you called Donald Trump one of New York's more famous men, right? Yes. But no sales attendant tried to help him. They did not. You have a memory of him saying the word lingerie? She says, as I wrote, I thought he might have said underwear. It meant the same thing. You know, the story was shaping up to be hilarious. So Trump, one of the most famous men in New York City, walks into one of the most famous bougie stores in New York. Nobody comes to help him. Place is empty. He walks around, walks right up to Carol. Nobody knows anything about it. Says, hey, you want to try some lingerie? It means the same thing, and she thinks the whole thing's hilarious this whole time. Did it seem like you were on the escalators for a long time? She says, yeah, it did, but the time went pretty quickly. Okay, but when you went up the elevators, you saw no one else? Well, so I was not looking for anyone. I was in an engaging conversation with Donald Trump. He says, I'm going to read to you from your testimony here today. The judge says, Mr. Takapina, I put out an order on this. He says, Your Honor, I have it. It's right here. And the judge might have said something like, don't read from testimony, it takes too much time. And he says, no, I have it right here. It's not going to take too much time. Filling in the gaps. I don't know if that's what happened. Says, I have it. It's right here. And he goes into it. Was the testimony you gave about not seeing anyone else being truthful? Says, I was not concentrated on it. Judge cuts him off again. You have your answer. Move on. It's your story. He, he, he does. Takapina says, so it's your story that while you were on the sixth floor, you didn't see a single person in the whole store? I did not. We went past cruise wear, could have been bathing suits. I saw no one else. You saw no sales attendants? I didn't see any. So it's your testimony, objection, argumentative. The judge says, you get to make a closing argument, so save it for that, right? It's your testimony is not really a question. So he does it again. So you, objection. And he says, Mr. Takapina, in this courtroom, the ruling is the ruling. And so move on. So he goes back. He says, Miss Carol, Bergdorf's is more expensive than some other stores out there, like Bloomingdale's, right? No offense to Bloomingdale's. She says, yeah. And so expensive lingerie, it could be shoplifted. Carol says, I don't know. And there was no one watching the lingerie boxes? She says there was a bodysuit. But you said Donald Trump told you to try on the lingerie, right? Yeah. He didn't tell you to go into a changing room with him, did he? She says, I told him to try it on because it was his color. So you said, you go try it on, right? He didn't tell you to go there and do it. You told him to go there. So he didn't coerce you into the changing room. That was your idea. It was funny. He weighed about what, 225 in 1996, says Joe. She says, yeah, that's what made it funny. You know, this manly man. Okay, so he says, so let me get this straight. So that was your plan. You wanted to get this large man to put on a not so large see-through bodysuit over his suit pants? Is that what you wanted? You wanted him to go into the locker, into the uh, changing room and just put that on? That's okay. He said, well, I don't know. I was just turning everything around. She said, actually, I had written a similar scene for Saturday Night Live and I won an Emmy for it. 
He said, you want an Emmy for your scene about lingerie? And she said, no, it's about his own underwear. She says, this is how comedy is born. Don't you know anything? Takapina says, did your bit air? And she said, yeah, it aired in 1987. William Shatner played the role. She says, it was very funny. He was falling in love with himself in the mirror. You should have seen it. It was a very poetic scene. I had Shatner there. He was very confused about what he was wearing. This was very advanced for its time. Now a lot of people are wearing different clothes these days. But back then, it was novel, and I won an Emmy for it, and all sorts of things. And Takapina says, are you done, lady? Are you done here? with your weird conversation? And she says, yes, I'm done now. Thank you for letting me reminisce about William Shatner in his underwear or in other people's underwear, lingerie, whatever the hell she wrote about. Carol says, yeah, I'm done. Sorry about that. Says, so you went with him then into the dressing room. Is that true, Carol? She says, well, I had no concept how it would turn out. Did you mention before he guided you with his arm into the locker room or changing room? Did you mention anything before? I'm not sure. You went in the room first? Yeah. And it was unlocked and you found it odd, right? Yeah, it did. And you called it, I think you said you called it an amazing happenstance. Is that right? She said, I was surprised. That's what an amazing happenstance means to you? She said, yes, I expected the joshing to continue. You didn't expect him to try it on then, right? You didn't expect him to put the uh, lingerie on, right? No, there was no time. He slammed the door. Well, if there was no one on the floor, why did you have to go into a dressing room if you were going to, you know, do the thing? She says, I don't know. They'd make it all the funnier. You know, there are mirrors in a dressing room. She wanted visuals. So Takapina says, okay, so Miss Carol, then it's your story that the door banged closed and he pushed you up against the wall and you say that it hurt. Is that right? Yeah. Did you think Donald Trump was trying to hurt you? I thought he'd made a mistake. It's very strange that I thought it was a mistake though. And your story goes that you heard a bang, right? Yes. And it was only after the second push against the wall that you realized the situation was serious. Not after the first banging of your head? She says, well, it took me several seconds to process what was going on. He put his mouth against mine and then I understood. You understood and you started laughing, right? I continued laughing. That is right. Laughing is a very good weapon to calm a man down if he has any erotic intention. Now, it's your story that at some point you felt the thing? She says, yes. And it's your story that he rummaged around down there in the thing for a while? And in your book, you said that he did some things? And how long did it take? She says, Takopina asks, And it took, what, three minutes? She said, no more than that. I didn't have a stopwatch. But you never screamed, right, Carol? I'm not a screamer. You said that yesterday. I heard you say that. So you're being attacked, but you didn't scream. Carol says, hey, you can beat up on me for not screaming. Takapina, he said, I'm not beating up on you. What are you, I'm asking you questions. She says, some don't scream. He says, all this in a surprisingly empty department store. Lawyer, objection sustained. Carol is fired up now. She said, women are told you better scream. I'm telling you, he attacked me whether I screamed or not. And she goes on this tirade. I didn't need to scream. Something screaming about this. All this. Takapina sitting there. He goes, do you need a minute? Sheesh. You done? All right. She says, no, I don't need a minute. Go on. I don't need an excuse for not screaming. 
Okay, but you wish you would have screamed, right? Of course I do. The more people believe me, then more people would have believed me, is what she says. Miss Carroll, did you prepare a list of answers that you'd give to questions that you might be asked? She says, what? What do you mean? What are you talking about? I, I prepare. Of course I prepare. Well, I want to show you an exhibit AR. They put it up. She says, oh. He said, you said, oh? Oh, what do you mean by that? Yes, I lost my glasses, but I'll try to read it. And her lawyer says, here are your glasses. Judge says, is this an evidence? The judge is, is objecting for the plaintiff. Is this an evidence? Takapina says, not yet. Then we're not going to discuss it, says the judge. Sorry, get it out. But the plaintiff says, your honor, um, I actually kind of agreed to this. Subject to, re subject to redaction, I have no objection. This is amazing. So the judge is actually objecting for the plaintiff before the plaintiff is objecting. And there actually is no objection because there were redactions in the document. The judge jumped the gun on this man and he got busted because this document that Takopina is trying to get in is, is agreed upon, meaning Ms. Carroll's lawyer agrees to it, but the judge wanted to keep it out anyways. And so the judge has to reverse himself. Is this an evidence? Not yet. Well, then we're not going to discuss it. And counsel says, well, I agreed to it, judge. Subject to redaction, no objection. Fine. Then I receive it on that basis. Takapina says, I won't know if the jury has it. Now on the screen, there's apparently something that says, why didn't you scream? Question mark. Other quote, too much adrenaline. Carol says, well, I mean, if I was going to lie, I would have said I screamed. I didn't scream because I didn't want to make a scene. Takapina says, you didn't want anyone to hear and help. You said that he was attacking you. And you said that, you know, the thing was there, but your tights were above your knees, right? The tights were above your knees, but you're having intercourse. Yes, I couldn't get my knee up. I tried to stomp his foot. Your purse was still in your hand? Yeah. Well, what kind of purse was it? A leather stand-up. You never hit him with your purse? Actually, I believe I did. When did you remember that? She says, always. Oh, well, that's a new fact. Well, that's interesting. <laughs> you pushed him off despite your panties and your tights were above your knees? She says, yeah, tights are amazingly stretchy. And you did all of this on four-inch heels, huh? I can dance on four-inch heels. You dance, you understand. Takopina says, I'm not going to respond to that one. Okay, so you got your knee up while you were being attacked, and then you walked out wearing those tights. She says, yeah, they did not come off. The tights never ripped either? I don't think so. I don't believe they did. And so it's your testimony that you don't know if Trump left any DNA evidence? She says, I don't know. I couldn't see what was going on. And you didn't seek help from anyone in the store after it happened? No, I didn't. Judge says, this is a good time for a break. Holy crap, this trial's going bad for us. Uh, break time. They come back. Takapina comes back and says, uh, Ms. Carroll, why of all the people that you could have called here, why was Lisa Bernbach the one that you chose to call? This woman here, best-selling author, one of the first people contacted. Carroll says, well, she was the person that I needed. I needed to see what she would tell me. She told me to stop laughing. I think I was just slightly disoriented. I thought it was tragic. Tecapina says, no, you said it was hilarious. What story were you going to tell Lisa that you thought was hilarious? And she says, well, let me rephrase that. I was hoping it was hilarious. Lisa told me exactly what I needed to hear. So she told you that you'd been attacked? I don't like that word. I don't like the word. She told you that you'd been ard? I don't like the word. Had it occurred to you? Had it occurred to you that you had been ard? She says, I just needed to tell someone the story. Uh, that's not what I asked you. Had it occurred to you 
that you had been ard. Objection sustained. And I don't know what that objection was. They asked and answered or argumentative. I don't know. But how long did this call with Ms. Bernbach last? I don't know. And she told you to go to the police? Yeah, she did. But I said, no way. I got in my car and drove him. So you sued Donald Trump then on November 4th, 2019. Is that right? Yeah. And four months before you sued, you say that you gave Lisa Bernbach and Carol Martin your chapter about Donald Trump just four months before you sued all this one after another. Yes. And you spoke with no one in your family about it. I would never, nor any authority. And you didn't take any medication. I'm not into medication. I may have taken an Advil. I'm not sure. Did you call in sick? No, but my area hurt. But you went into work, right? You said, yeah, that's how I do it. I just go on. Now, your friend Carol Martin, she didn't like Donald Trump. Is that right? She was an anchor woman in New York. I didn't ask that. Carol's counsel says, I think she asked that. Carol says, I was afraid I'd have to face two tables of lawyers and that's what happened. Takapina says, we have the same number of lawyers here, Miss Carol. Judge says, come on, Mr. Takapina, move on here. Carol says, I finally thought, you know, I've been silent for too long. But you never told one of your doctors ever, no. And there was nothing visible ever. He says, well, you can't see inside of there. But you said your head was injured. No, that was hidden by my hair. Okay, so I'm going to read from your book. What is this word here in your book? Starts with a G. She says it's gonadal. Gonadal. What does that mean? Oh, she says that means the glow of the male gonads. It's true. It happens. You said it was odd that you did not report it. Objection asked and answered. What does gonadal mean? The glow of the male gonads. (laughs) Attack of peanut goes back. Do you have any tweets where anyone threatened you? Yes, but I deleted them. Hmm, should have been an FBI agent. But you say you opened your Twitter yesterday to see, and I opened it today too. Any threats, Carol, today? No, of course not. (laughs) No, no threats to Carol because nobody endorses or wants Carol to be threatened. No threats. They dug up a couple and they ended their entire direct testimony on those posts. But she checked today, this morning, in the middle of trial. Any threats today? No, nothing. Interesting. Miss Carol, did you interview with Lawrence O'Donnell in 2019? Yes. Takapina says, let's put it on the screen. And he says, no, that's Chris Matthews. And Judge says, hey, look. If you can't do this, let's move on. Apparently, he's having trouble getting the video to play. And Judge Kaplan says, look, if you can't do this, let's move on. He gives him like two seconds. Is it playing? Nope. All right, you can't play it. Next next question. Move on. So they finally, Taco Pina's like, all right, we got it up, Judge. Relax. Starts to play it. Says, let's play the exhibit. O'Donnell says to Miss Carroll, Would you bring an R charge against Trump? She says, no. It would be disrespectful to women on the border. Attacked around the clock. Mine was three minutes. I'm an adult. I've moved on. I'm happy. Holy moly. That is a heck of a clip right there. So that's on Carol and O'Donnell. I don't think I've ever seen that one. Yeah, so that's a fun clip. No, it would be disrespectful to other women. Mine was three minutes. Takapina asks, you stand by that? She says, I'd read a news story that day about women on the border and I felt bad. So that's why I said it. And you also spoke on a podcast about a camp counselor who supposedly abused you. You said he was a hideous man, number six. 
His name was Cam or something like that. You remember him? Yeah. And you said Cam impacted you most of all of these attacks on you? Says, I don't know the context of this. Do we have it? Uh, no, we'll figure it out. He says, you learned Cam was arrested years later. Yeah. You realize he may have abused other objections. Carol's counsel says, this is not a criminal case, Your Honor, and sustained. And Takapina says, well, you haven't brought a criminal case. And the judge scolds him and says, yeah, in New York, a private citizen cannot bring a criminal case. And says, yeah, but she didn't go to the police. The judge says, move on, move on. Yeah, they couldn't bring a criminal case because she didn't go to the police, judge. So don't give her an excuse like she can't bring a criminal case. This judge, this judge, again, is basically vouching for this witness, saying that Carol, he's defending her. Yeah, but you didn't bring a criminal case. She can't bring a criminal case. No, that's true, but she can go talk to the police about it and the police can bring a criminal case. She could have done that. He says, move on. So you never tried to get any video footage from Bergdorf's over the years? Objection. Can we get a time frame on this? He says, then or ever. I don't care. Did you ever try to get video? Carol's counsel says, I object to the breadth of the question. And the judge sustains it and says, she said what she said. You never tried to get videos from Bergdorf's? She said what she said, so she probably said no, so it doesn't matter. You're a writer, Miss Carol. You wrote every day when you were married to Steve Byers, is that true? She said, I was pitching back then, and everyone said no. But you never put any of this attack in your diary? She says, I don't write about negative things. You write about throwing a ball for a dog, right? Yeah, she says, yeah, you got my diaries in Discovery. I wrote that hundreds of times. You kept the dress that you were wearing? Says, yeah, it was beautiful. Judge says, we're done for the day. We're going to break for the day and return on Monday. And then the jury leaves. And the judge comes back. This is unbelievable. The judge says, hey, Takapina, where are you going with this? He says, your honor, the witness is still right here. He says, fine, if you object, that's fine. And he asks Miss Carol to leave. He says, Miss Carol, please leave the room. She's collecting her bag. And Carol leaves the room and the judge is going to scold into Takapina. He says it would go faster if we stop asking argumentative questions. Takapina says, Your Honor, I've done this for some time, okay? I'm sorry if I sounded argumentative. He said, more than once, more than one, you've done this. And I sustained objections. And Takapina, rightfully, Absolutely right, says, I'm at a loss. I'm at a loss, Your Honor. I'm, I'm at a total loss. You sustained as to her not going to the police? Why'd you do that? He says, that's as notorious a fact as the Yankees have not won the World Series in years. He says, yeah, or the Mets. He says, I'll give you that. He says, my wife does tell me I do hyperbole. But he says, and Jonathan Swift, it was a sense of irony. I commend it to you. When I looked at the cover of this lady's books, it brought back nightmares of Jonathan Swift. Takapina says, do you remember my cousin Vinny? He says, yeah, I'm from Staten Island, of course. All right, have a great weekend. That's the end. So they're chatting about my cousin Vinny at the end of this thing. All right, you see how this goes? Oh, gosh. So Takapina is getting obliterated by the judge, but it's all just business, and they've been doing it for a long time. Takapina knows he's getting obliterated. The judge doesn't care. Yeah, no. You sustained her. Yeah. I sustain her not going to the police because we already know about it. Everybody knows about it. It's a notorious fact that the Yankees have not won the World Series. And Joe, you know, for, look, it might be fun and funny and kind of jokey and jovial, but this is consequential. This is Trump's case. This is Takapina getting scolded basically in front of the jury. And the judge is vouching for Miss Carroll and actually calling out objections about evidence being admitted, even though it was already agreed upon and there was no objection subject to the redactions from the plaintiff's team. It's crazy. And so Joe Takapina is at a loss, but of course, because he has been doing this for some time, it just, it is what it is. Okay. I'm at a loss and uh, that's it. So that's the day three 
of the trial. And this is going to be a disaster for the Trump defense. Th this was objection after objection after objection sustained on behalf of the plaintiff. In fact, the judge was making objections that the plaintiff wasn't even making. So this is, uh, it's just going to be a, a trip. Southern District of New York, here we are. So my friends, that is day three. We covered some good grounds. We have Rape is Sexy, E. Jean Carroll, who is out there on the examination witness stand. She'll be back there tomorrow for more cross-examination. We'll see what Judge Kaplan does about it, but holy moly, what a day. And so we'll continue to cover this trial. We'll continue into day four. We'll be here covering every inch of it. Thank you for subscribing and joining us. And thank you for inviting somebody over here and telling us, telling them that we're covering the Trump trial and we'll continue to do it. We would love to see you back when we get into it. But that my friends is it for us on the day. And we covered some good ground, a lot of Trump trial updates, and of course, a lot of proud boy trial updates, which we will continue to monitor. We'll see if we get a verdict this week, according to Roger Parloff and others may not be something that comes in just because of the fact that we've got a lot of evidence to go through, a lot of different counts to review, and a lot to unpack. And so that is it for us on the day, my friends. Now it's time to hear from you and to see what you have to say about this. I saw some very, very nice super chats come in, and we always appreciate those. Love your generosity. Thank you, everybody, for those. And hey, holy moly, who is here? Dolphin fan with five gifts. Amazing. Dolphin fan invited some new people over to our chat. We love you, Dolphin fan. Thank you so much. So Crystal's coming in. Digga Warp is in here. Spartan's here. Glenn Croy. Clues is here. And Gloria B. All gifted memberships. Courtesy of our friend, Dolphin fan. Thank you so much, Dolphin fan. We appreciate you, my friend. All right. And we had some other great super chats come in on YouTube. And let's do a refresh on the screen. And by the way, if you become a member, like Dolphin Fan just invited, whether you join us at watchingthewatchers.locals.com or if you click the join button on YouTube, don't forget to grab our Telegram link and stick around for the after party because we're about to go there in about a few minutes as soon as we're done here. We're not going to be done for the day. We appreciate our members and the support for the work we do. All right, we got some great questions that came in. Thank you, everybody, for these. Who is here? Patrick Parker said TNT MAGA, baby. We were talking about this this morning on our member-only stream. TNT MAGA, the idea that it's Trump and Tucker. 2024, baby. Patrick sent another one. Thanks, Patrick. Says, Ray Epps is like a chihuahua. He will bark, but the instant that you come after him, he back down like a word for a female dog. He, he has gotten pretty threat happy, right? I think he sent one over to Tucker, but we'll see if he actually files any litigation. I mean, I'm curious. I, I think it'd be very great if he filed because then we could ask him all sorts of questions and he would very likely have to sit for a deposition for one of those things. Hey, and thank you, Patrick. Tony Hay, Tony Hay Munkets is here, says, it's so nice to have you. Someone with common sense like all of us, but knows the law can explain what's going on. I share you with everyone I know. Tony, that's such a nice thing. Thank you for saying that. It's a very nice compliment. And I'm grateful that you are here. You know, it's a lot of fun to go through these things together. I tell you, it's, you know, it's really just a, it's a great time to go through these things together. It would be, you know, I, there was a time in my life when I would just read through the news myself and just sit here and brood over it. But the fact that we get to have some fun and talk about it and learn some stuff, I think is a very fun experience. I'm grateful that you are here and joining us. Who else is in the house? We got Leonard said, E. Jean Carroll, W. Somerset, Mog, Ham. Coinky Dink? I don't know who that person is. I don't know who that is. So I'd have to look it up. I don't know who that is, but it might be a Coinky Dink or a coincidence. Thank you for sending that in, Leonard. And who is this person? I wasn't sure who this is. Yes, a writer known for his plays and short stories. Schooled in, uh, so there must be some connection there that I don't know about, but very interesting, Leonard. Have to look into that one. Here, this one from Tony Hay. 
says, it's so hard to multitask you and live chat. I love what people say on your live chat and I go back and forth, just trying to take everything in. Love it. Well, we love that, Tony. It is. We have a very lively chat. Smartest people out there on the interwebs are in our chat, sharing intelligence and witty comments and all sorts of brilliance every day. And Tony, we're glad that you're a part of it, my friend. We love you and love the chat. We have Stephen says, you're amazing. Thank you, Stephen. That's a very nice one. And a nice sticker coming in here from our friend Stephen M in the house. Thank you very much, Stephen. I very much appreciate it. We had another one from Fred. Hey, Fred Petamonte and his rascally dog, Johnny. He says, Rob, Johnny's mad. Douglas Mackey is facing 10 years for a Twitter meme. Alec Baldwin killed an injured one and the charges were dropped. This is two tears and cannot continue. Great comment from Johnny. It's true. It's crazy. Douglas Mackey. Yeah. I mean, he should have been a democratic actor. Then you can just accidentally uh, shoot and kill a woman and you're just fine. No problems at all. But you post an illegal mean that makes Democrats look like idiots and you go to jail. JM says the judge is testifying as an expert witness and doing it poorly from our friend JM in the house. Thank you, Jay. He did feel like he was actively getting involved in the case. Sheesh. Tara Rayner is here, says, Breach of shared a thread of EJC cringe tweets. Okay, cool. That'll probably be a good one. There's probably a bunch of them. Um, yeah, I'll have to take a look at that. Thank you for the heads up on that from Tara. Tara says, I hear E. Jean Carroll's story is a law and order SVU episode. <laughs> it's a wild story. And there's no evidence to really support any of it. And none of it makes any sense. And she is about as, as uh, conflicted through partisan influence and personal influence internally and externally that I, you know, this case should have never even gotten this far, but it's about, it's not even about the outcome of the case. It's about just tripping Trump up. They'd love to win, no doubt about it and get a big fat settlement, but they'd much rather just see, I mean, the real takeaway here, the victory is Trump is being sued, or in this case, kind of pseudo prosecuted. It's a civil case, but it's based on an old criminal allegation that they couldn't prosecute any longer. So they're just trying to extrapolate whatever they can out of it and get their pound of flesh. Thank you, Tara, for both of those. She's a lot of cringe, no doubt. Curtis Bartle says, I have never laughed so much watching, watching. I like it. Go Trump. <laughs> it's kind of, it's, you know, it's, you don't want to beat up on unwell people. You definitely don't want to beat up on people who are victims of crimes. You definitely don't want to beat up on people who have been injured and been attacked, but you also don't believe all women. That's also insanity, right? We don't live in that world. And I don't know why the people keep saying that. No, you don't. You believe the presumption of innocence. You believe in people having due process and equal protection of the law. You don't believe in weaponized political prosecutions or lawfare being executed by partisan democratic actors as due process, as legitimate institutions or, or efforts in this country. And we don't need to indulge that and we're not going to do it. So those were the great questions that came in from our friends on YouTube. We're going to do one refresh. I think I saw another one come in. Hey, American Dreamer says love to your mom. Shh, indeed. Got the, got the best mama. She's an amazing mama. And actually, you know, speaking of mama and Eric's house, they are doing an auction right now at ericshouse.org. I believe is where I can access this. Where is the auction? All right, I'll look it up and I'll figure I'll find the link for tomorrow. They have an auction going on and I wanted to share that but I can't find the link for it. Anyways, there's an auction going on at ericshouse.org. Mama, I'll plug that tomorrow. All right. And so those are our friends on YouTube. Thank you American Dreamer. Love to your mom and love back to your mom there, American Dreamer as well. Okay, and so Let's see, let's say hello to our friends over on Telegram and James, James Cutberth over on Locals. Shout out to James. Says, hi, Rob. Good to see you, James. And we're going over to our after party here 
in a very short minute. But we're checking in to make sure we said hello to everybody. On Rumble, we got P Tranch Mom. We got Donut Mind Me, Chappaquiddick Drinker, La Azteca, R.D. Hayward's in the house. Indoctrination, all chatting away over on Rumble. Let's say hello to Twitter before we wrap it up on the day. And let me see if I can grab this auction link. I know I have it. Here it is. It's at 32auctions.com slash Eric's house. That's why I couldn't find it. So here it is. If you want to check it out, they're doing some good work. Hey, look at this. Thank you for supporting Eric's house. Eric's house, summer smiles, online auction. That's your boy right there. Hey, look at that. So that is where you can go. 32auctions.com slash Eric's house. And looks like some good stuff there. That's my mama right there. Marianne Govea, baby. And that is my former law firm sponsoring. Good stuff. So 32auctions.com slash Eric's house. They're raising money. It's a great nonprofit organization to help people heal after suicide, substance, abuse, loss, or sudden loss for other things. So check it out. Eric'sHouse.org. Amazing organization. All sorts of good stuff. And I'll drop the link in the uh, in the chat if you want to poke on over there and peruse around. Good stuff over there. Amazing people doing very good work. Hey, thank you, V. V got the link. Thank you, V. Uh, and yeah, get something good, baby. Get something good. Okay, over on Twitter, we've got anybody watching on Twitter? Nine people? Holy moly, that's almost 10. Who's here? Danny McWilliams says, this is sounding like a bad blonde joke. Asking, is the judge pushing his authority too far? It's too much for my liking, but it doesn't mean that he can't do it. Like Rob's mom says, the veggies want to be eaten. It's true. My mom always made us eat our vegetables. In fact, we had a whole dinner called boiled dinner. You guys ever have a boiled dinner? Anybody else ever have those when you were kid? kids? Boiled dinner. It was like a bunch of vegetables thrown in a pot and boiled. I think it might be an Italian thing. And then we smash up uh, all the food and then put olive oil on it and then pretend it's delicious, you know? <laughs> it was good. It was good. I actually like boiled dinner. I think it's pretty dang good. Sounds good. Maybe I'll ask mama to make it. All right. And so that's what we had as, you know, as young, young boys growing up. That's what we did. All right. And so that, my friends, is it for us on the day. I think we are going to leave it right there. We are, hey, Jigum, Jigum Gigum is here. I, for, I almost missed Jigum Gigum. Jigum Gigum is in the house, and here we have this one. <laughs> okay, this is great. All right, so Jigum Gigum, as you know, is one of our meme smith extraordinaires on the locals. And if you want to join up on locals, this is some of the fun that you're, you know, you're, you're, you're missing. Jigum says, haven't been able to crank out the memes I'd like to for you, Rob. And all those amazing watching the watchers, locals, and Telegram community members. Too many encroaching deadlines, but soon I will be back having memes some fun. Oh, I see what you did there. But for now, love y'all. And here's the meme she put together for us. Hey, much love. Hey, that's from one of our, um, one of our live streams. Probably one of our members only live streams. Much love, everybody. All right. And thank you, Jigum. Hopefully you're being ultra productive. We appreciate it when you can stop by and have fun. And uh, we love it when you're here, whenever you can be here. We just yeah, appreciate you. Thank you so much. Jay Cutberth says, hey, Rob. Good to see you, James, as well. <laughs> yeah. And hey, STFU says Norwegian boiled dinner involves Polska and kielbasa. Yeah, it's good. It's good. We'd have, we'd put kielbasa in there, right? The big sausage are in there. All good stuff. And I think we had another one. V is reminding me before we wrap it up on the day. Tara says, how do I share a vid of my car accident from Tara two days ago? How do I share a vid of my car accident? Well, it depends what you want to share it for. I would share it probably with your insurance company before I'd share it with anybody else. Make sure your insurance company is aware of, you know, what happened and talk about that, or, you know, uh, but if you wanted to share it with the public, 
Hopefully you're okay if you're in a car accident. Hopefully you're okay. And if you need to talk to a lawyer about that, you might want to talk to a personal injury lawyer about that. But if you wanted to share the video of it, share it with me. Oh, well, you can, you can email it to me. My email is robert at spotlightlawyer.com. Are you looking for my opinion on it or for the show? Is it a good segment for the show? Yeah. Send it over. You could upload it on, you could upload it on locals. You could upload it on YouTube. I guess I just didn't know what the point was, but yeah, you can send it to me, Robert at spotlightlawyer.com as well. You can email me. Anybody can email me, whatever you want. <laughs> Tara's laughing. Okay, cool. Well, send it over Tara. I'll see, I'll see what it's about. And I appreciate you being here. Okay. So we will wrap it up, my friends. That is it for us. We are going to go over to our after party with our friends at watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Come hang out with us, whether you're a member on YouTube or on Locals. Get the Telegram group because if you're on YouTube, you can join us, but it's on Telegram. It's not going to be on YouTube. So also watchingthewatchers.locals.com if you want to join us. We do member-only morning streams. We'll be back here tomorrow morning to do it again. If you want some extra stuff, some extra you know content and a real community to connect with, watchingthewatchers.locals.com. Also, don't forget to get your field of greens. And it's not just greens. They've got collagen. They've got sleep stuff. They've got energy stuff, all sorts of stuff. Fieldofgreens.com. Mother's Day is coming up. You can save 15% with code Robert. The vegetables want to be eaten. It's good for you and for your mama. Also, check out spotlightlawyer.com slash mind map if you want to dig into a mind map software like this. It's a great tool. I love it. I use it for all sorts of stuff, not just the show. I use it to organize personal productivity stuff and like vision boarding. It's basically an infinite canvas that you can just do whatever you want with. So check it out. Get a free account, spotlightlawyer.com slash mind map. But all right, my friends, that is it for us. Let's say thank you to the mods and the meme smiths, our friends, V Anti Kiss Prime, K Bean in the house, along with Just Cause, Playin' Hooky, Ronnie Cole, Zulu, Geomancy, Zach Nichols, John Allen's in the house, our friends Janek, Dog Digger, and Donut Mind Me, modding down the fort for us. And shout out to our friends Sleepy Dogly and our meme smith, Gigum Gigum, who has brought out the newest meme gif gif delivery courtesy of jigam we appreciate you jigam and that my friends is it for us on the day so we are going over to the after party we would love to see you there as we wrap it up otherwise we will be here tomorrow to do it all again and we hope to see you here so that together with your help we can shine that big beautiful spotlight of accountability and transparency down upon our system with the hope of finding justice. Have a beautiful evening, my friends. Sleep very well. See you right back here tomorrow. Bye-bye.